In this presentation, we are going to discuss about Indonesia, how it was under Dutch colonization, how it has been affected in the different wars, and the country's relationship with the Western powers today. We're going to give you a little introduction about Indonesia. So today, it is apparent that Indonesia is extremely diverse, with different ethnic groups, languages, and religions. But this can all be traced back to when the Dutch colonized the nation. After the Mataram Empire crumbled and collapsed in the 18th century, the Dutch United East India Company, or the VOC as they call it, established itself as the dominant economic and political power in Java. This Dutch trading corporation had been a dominant force in Asian trade since the early 1600s. But later on in the 18th century, they began to show an interest in interfering in indigenous politics on the Indonesian island of Java in order to strengthen their grip in the local economy. Now, let's talk about the life at the turn of the century under colonialism for Indonesia. So, the Dutch managed to establish a Dutch monopoly of spice trade through an alliance with the Sultan of Ternate in 1607 to control production of cloves and the nutmeg trade, which were controlled from the Banda Islands. The Dutch are going to set up their new capital for their trading empire in Indonesia at a small town called Jakarta. Then they remake and rename it Batavia. They became known as the Dutch East Indies. By the mid-17th century, Batavia had become an important trade center. They repelled attacks from the Javanese Mataram Kingdom, and the Java is the island in the center of Indonesia. So in 1667, the Dutch defeated the Sulawesi city of Makassar, which brought its trade under the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, control. This expanded to other regions as well. The Dutch initially came to Indonesia for trade, but the native populations continually fought against them in an effort to keep what they had taken. The Dutch expanded because they were looking for teak wood. Spices didn't really need that much room to grow, but teak woods required whole forests. So, the Dutch were always trying to control more land. The entire Dutch East India Company premise was that they needed to maintain a monopoly. If not, their profit and power would decrease and it would all snowball to their eventual collapse. The Dutch were not really concerned with converting the people of Indonesia that were mostly Islamic and Hindu to Christianity. They were more concerned about the gold or money. Just like the cities back in the Netherlands, Batavia was built with many canals so it could be easier to travel and transport goods. So as Adan Matt has explained in his video, VOC personnel lived apart from indigenous Indonesians and the Dutch people were classified as low status. As a result, while the VOC contributed objects, skills, and corporate structure to Indonesian culture, it had little impact on Indonesian thinkers. In colonial Java, the Dutch form of rule was both direct and dualistic. In addition to the Dutch hierarchy, an indigenous one existed, which served as a link between the Javanese peasants and the European civil service. The Javanese aristocracy, who had previously run the Mataram administration, was at the pinnacle of this indigenous institution. They now had to carry out the wishes of the Dutch center. Governors general acted like royalty, refusing to leave the enclaves that they had created, and like Indonesian royalty, they organized labor with the help of local aristocracy and Chinese agents. Chinese immigrants who have been in Indonesia for several generations owned the land around Batavia. They also owned cabbage farms as well. The native Indonesians were not permitted to live in the city because they were a threat to the institution. As time went by, Eurasians began to grow. So Eurasians were people who were mixed, half European and half Asian. Eurasian girls were mostly daughters of VOC officials and their native or Chinese wives. The term totok was a Japanese term used to refer to immigrants of Chinese, Arab, or European descent. This term was the opposite of the term Indo people, who were of mixed indigenous and foreign descent. So as the Chinese population grew in Indonesia, they were used as tax farmers to collect taxes for the government. Most of them abused their power and became rich by doing so, so many people did not like them. During the colonial period, Dutch forces tortured, 
raped, and executed Indonesian civilians on a daily basis. Thousands of pro-independence activists were imprisoned even in the latter years of colonialism. There were not many groups in Indonesia that were okay with being colonized, so they didn't really support the colonial powers. However, outside of Indonesia, people in the anti-revolutionary party supported the ethical policy. So, under the leadership of the anti-revolutionary party, a coalition of Christian parties won the Dutch legislative elections in September of 1901. This new government gave colonial issues a strategic significance, emphasizing the need for more reform of the Netherlands' colonial policy in the Far East. This gave birth to the ethical colonial policy, which was backed by both conservative Christian leaders and elements of the worker-led social democratic movement attempting to satisfy the metropolitan state's moral obligation to the East Indies native population. In other words, it was a program introduced by the Dutch in the East Indies at the turn of the 20th century aimed at promoting the welfare of the indigenous Indonesians or the Javanese. The time had come for the Dutch to pay the debt of honor to the Indonesian people by promoting reforms in education and agriculture and by decentralizing the Indies administration providing more autonomy for Indonesian officials. Other groups such as the People's Council or the Volksrad were the representatives for the people of the Dutch East Indies. Not only that, Indo people were used as tools to keep them, the colonialists, in power as well. So by mixing the whites with the natives, they were able to somewhat integrate their blood and their values into the Javanese society. These groups all saw that the Dutch were doing something good for the Indonesian people, that's why they were supporters of the colonial powers. Now let's talk about the groups which resisted the colonial powers. It was clear that a lot of natives did not want to be colonized by the Dutch. A clear example of this could be seen in the 1906 Puputan or the Balinese ritual mass suicide. So to avoid being captured by the Dutch invaders, they all committed a mass suicide. When the Dutch army showed up, the head priest stabbed the Raja's heart with a dagger. Then, the entire group began to kill one another. So, in the end, over 1,000 Balinese people committed suicide just to escape from the Dutch. In addition, Indonesian nationalism and movements supporting independence from Dutch colonialism, such as Budi Utomo, the Indonesian National Party or PNI, the Saraket Islam, and the Indonesian Communist Party, or PKI, grew rapidly in the first half of the 20th century. Firstly, Budi Otomo, which is Indonesian for noble endeavor, was the first native political society founded in 1908 by students in Batavia. The birth of Indonesian nationalism is largely attributed to this incident. It established a political tradition in which cooperation between the young Indonesian elite and the Dutch colonial authorities was believed to result in the country's eventual independence. Budi Otomo's primary aim was first not political, however it gradually shifted towards political aims with representatives in the conservative Volksrad, or the People's Council that we talked about, and in the provincial councils in Java. The next were a group called Sarket Islam, originally founded to promote indigenous entrepreneurs against the dominating Chinese in the local economy. The Sarkat Islam or Islamic Union broadened its scope and acquired a popular political consciousness with revolutionary tendencies. The party was founded in 1912 as a group of Muslim merchants who intended to further their economic interests in regard to Chinese merchants in Java, but it quickly evolved into a political organization. It rapidly received widespread support mostly due to its religious appeal and began campaigning towards the Dutch East Indies self-government. As Indonesian nationalism began to increase, at the Youth Pledge in 1928, three ideals were proclaimed, one motherland, one nation, and one language. The Britannica website describes this as a landmark event in the country's history and also the founding moment of the Indonesian language. It was very significant because this pledge helped Indonesia's unification in Indonesia's struggle for independence. The fourth one would be the Indonesian National Party, also known as PNI, which was founded by future President Sukarno in 1927.
The goal of the group was to provide the Indonesian archipelago with economic and political freedom. This would all be achieved by non-cooperation with the Dutch colonial regime. And lastly, a very controversial party was the Indonesian Communist Party, or PKI, which grew out of the Indonesian struggle against Dutch colonialism. By 1965, the party claimed to have three and a half million members, which makes it the largest communist party in any non-communist country. By exploiting existing societal divisions, the PKI offered a new modernist philosophy that tried to rectify injustices and build public support. In 1925, there were plans for a revolution to overthrow the Dutch colonial government, which the Common Turn Executive Committee ordered the Indonesian communists to form an anti-imperialist coalition with non-communist, nationalist organizations, and extremist elements led by Alamin and Musso, who were leaders of the Communist Party. Let's move on to the important leaders of Indonesia during the colonization period. Firstly, Herman Willem Dendels, Governor General from 1808 to 1811 during the French occupation of Holland. And secondly, British Lieutenant Sir Stamford Raffles, Governor General from 1811 to 1816 during the British occupation of Java. Dendels was the one who recognized the central and regional colonial administration by dividing Java into districts, also known as residencies. Each one hated by a European civil servant called the resident, who was directly subordinate and had to report to the governor general in Batavia. These residents were responsible for a wide range of matters in their residencies, varying from legal matters to the organization of agriculture. Later, Raffles carried on the reforms begun by his predecessor by overhauling Java's judicial, police, and administrative systems. He enacted the land tax, which required Javanese peasants to pay the government a levy equal to roughly two-fifths of their annual yield. Raffles was also genuinely interested in Java's cultures and languages. He authored The History of Java, one of the first scholarly books on the subject, in 1817. However, his administrative reorganizations meant that foreign powers were increasingly intervening in Java society and economy, as seen by the increased number of middle-ranking European officials working in the residence. This number climbed from 73 to 190 between 1825 and 1890. Followed by the reaction of the native people to the Chinese, Indians, and Europeans living among them before, during, and after colonization. First, for the Chinese. The Chinese Indonesian population went from being considered equal to the indigenous Indonesian population to being considered and embracing their Chinese heritage sites, and then to being legal barred from both their Chinese and Indonesian heritage, and occupying a separated, isolated space in between. Through every step of the way, there were always sectors of Chinese Indonesian population that tried to ascertain political power, but mostly the Chinese Indonesian populations mostly just chose to identify their nationality as whatever they thought would help them best. During Sukarno's era, the Chinese Indonesians thought it would be their Chinese heritage that would save them. But during Suharto's era, Chinese Indonesians quickly learned that they must assimilate as much as possible while knowing they could never truly assimilate with the indigenous Indonesian population. Particularly in Suharto's era, the Chinese Indonesians possibly had their Chinese heritage and political power stripped as they grown richer than ever. Second, 
for the Indians. The earliest recorded Indonesian history shows extensive religious influences from India. The early Indonesian states that center on Java or Sumatra evolved through many forms of Hinduism and Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism. During the 9th century, both Hinduism and Buddhism were practiced as court religion. Shiva and Buddha were looked upon as manifestations of the same spiritual being. The blending of the two religions continued until 14th century, when Islam brought by Muslim traders primarily from South Asia emerged as the dominant religion along the coasts of Java and Sumatra. By the 15th century, Islam had gained a firm footing in coastal areas of other islands of the archipelago as well. Throughout all the religious changes on the court level, the common people adopted part of each new religion as an additional layer on top of their traditional local beliefs. Consequently, Islam is expressed differently in Indonesia than it is in the Middle East. The religion is most strictly practiced in Aceh, Western Sumatra, Western Java, Southeastern Kalimantan, and some of the lesser Sunda islands. Lastly, for the European, when you ask an Indonesian about the colonial period, whether the individual is highly educated or ignorant, he or she will tell you that the Dutch colonized Indonesia for three and a half centuries fall. First and foremost, it assumes that Indonesia was already a cohesive nation in the late 15,000s or early 16,000s. In actuality, Indonesia was patchwork of separate indigenous kingdoms that lacked a sense of brotherhood, nationalist emotion, or any other sense of togetherness. Warfare between these kingdoms, whether inter- or intra-island, was the norm rather than the exceptions. Second, the whole territory that is now known as Indonesia was not captured by the Dutch at the same time, and thereafter, occupied for 3.5 centuries, on the contrary, centuries of slow political growth were required before the territory came under Dutch rule. In fact, until the 1930s, the Dutch essentially controlled the whole territory that is now known as Indonesia. Some parts of the archipelago were colonized for 3.5 centuries, while others were dominated by the Dutch for about two centuries. For example, most of Java. But most other parts of this vast archipelago were gradually conquered over the course of the 19th and the early 20th century. And natives in many regions never saw a Dutch person. So why does there exist the view that Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch for three and a half centuries? The answer in politics as becomes clear from the synopsis above, Indonesian nationalism was driven by the realization among the young and diverse people of the archipelago that they had one common enemy, which is the Dutch colonial power. Having this enemy is basically what unifying the native people of Indonesia. After independence from the Dutch, the Indonesian government needed to keep the Indonesian nation unified. One smart strategy was by creating this common 3.5 century colonial history that was shared by all people in the Indonesian nation. If the Indonesian people would realize that they did not have the same history, it would jeopardize the unity of Indonesia, especially in the fragile 1940s and 1950s. In recent years, there has started to become more and more Indonesians who are aware of this issue and argue that without a colonial period, there would most likely not have developed a single Indonesian nation 
but more likely, there would have been various separate nation states in line with a distribution of old native kingdoms and empires in the archipelago. In 1914, an exiled Dutch socialist, Henk Snevelit, founded the Indies Social Democratic Association. Initially, a small group of Dutch socialists, later evolving into the Communist Party of Indonesia, or what's known as the PKI, in 1924, the Dutch established the People's Council at the end of World War One to fulfill their promise to integrate the Indonesian community more closely with the government. The People's Council comprised of appointed and elected representatives from the government's three racial divisions: Dutch, Indonesian, and Foreign Asiatic. Offered opportunities for debate and criticism, but no real control over the East Indies government. The Dutch responded after World War One with repressive measures. After World War One. The Dutch colonial strongly repressed any movement or change. This repression strengthened the PKI. After committing to independent action, the PKI began to shift towards a policy of unilateral opposition to the colonial regime. It launched a revolt in Java at the end of 1926, and in Western Sumatra at the beginning of 1927, without the support of the Communist International. And even without complete anonymity within its own ranks, these movements would include elements of traditional protest as well as genuine communist insurgency. Were easily crushed by the East Indies government, effectively ending communist activity for the remainder of the colonial period. By 1924, the PKI had over 1,140 members. A year later, in 1925. The PKI had grown to three thousand members. Between nineteen twenty six to nineteen twenty seven, the PKI led a rebellion against Dutch colonialism and the harsh repression of strikes of urban workers. However, the strikes and rebellion were a failure, resulting in thirteen thousand nationalists and communist leaders being arrested by the Dutch. Forty five thousand were given prison sentences. Nationalist leaders arise from groups of young professionals and students, some of whom had been educated in the Netherlands. Post World War One, the Indonesian communists that were associated with Communist International started to usurp the nationalist movement. The Indonesian National Revolution, or the Indonesian War for Independence, is part of the aftermath of the Second World War and decolonization of Asia. The revolution took place between Indonesia's declaration of independence in 1945 and Netherlands' recognition of Indonesia's independence in 1949. Britain, Netherlands, and the United States try to defend the colony from Japanese army as they move south in search of Dutch oil in 1941. The Japanese forces invaded the Dutch East Indies as part of the Pacific War. The rubber plantations and oil fields of the Dutch East Indies were incentive for the Japanese war effort. The Allied forces struggled to withstand the Japanese invasion. The Royal Dutch East Indies Army surrendered in Java in March 1942. The Japanese occupation of Indonesia for three and a half years during World War II was a crucial factor in the subsequent revolution. Vast majority of the Dutch East Indies population initially welcomed the Japanese as liberators from the colonial Dutch Empire. Although the sentiment changed quickly, as the occupation of the Japanese turned out to be far more oppressive and ruinous than the Dutch colonial government, according to the UN, a total of four million people died in Indonesia as a result of the Japanese occupation. The Netherlands army could not withhold its colony against the Japanese army. After three months, the Japanese had seized control of the Dutch East Indies, Java, and Sumatra, Indonesia's two most dominant islands. The Japanese encouraged and spread nationalist ideocracy, although this propaganda was encouraged more for Japanese political advantage rather than in support of Indonesia's independence. This support spawned several Indonesian institutions, 
along with elevating nationalist political leaders like Sukarno. The Japanese destroyed and replaced much of the economic, administrative, and political infrastructure. By September 1944, Japanese forces were facing inevitable defeat. Prime Minister Koizo assured Indonesia's independence. Sukarno's supporters perceived this announcement as vindication for Sukarno's collaboration with the Japanese. Two days after following the Japanese surrender in August 1945, nationalist leader Sukarno and Hatta declared Indonesia's independency. The following day, the Preparatory Committee for Indonesian Independence, or the PPKI, elected Sukarno as president and Hatta as vice president. The Dutch accused Sukarno and Hatta of colluding with the Japanese and denounced Indonesia as a creation of Japanese fascism. The United States loaned the Dutch East Indies $10 million to finance its return to Indonesia. In 1949, the United States put international pressure on the Netherlands, threatening to cut off economic aid for World War II rebuilding efforts to the Netherlands and the partial military stalemate. Fearing the United States' threats, the Netherlands agreed to recognize Indonesia's independence. Sukarno's government campaigned for Indonesia's control of the territory, along with pressure from the United States. The Netherlands agreed to the New York Agreement, which gives up control of territory to Indonesian administration in May 1963. The relationship between the United States and Indonesia from 1943 to 1949 showed the negative effects of the U.S. strategy in the Cold War. This would get worse in the coming years. The fight between U.S. and Indonesian nationalist leaders helped to make the turmoil in Indonesia last even longer than it had already been. Every time Indonesian moderated have tried to use diplomacy instead of armed resistance to get what they want. The United States pro-Dutch neutrality has made them less powerful in the Indonesian ruling coalition. Indonesian Republican moderates used all of their political capital in their talks with the Dutch, which made it hard for them to stay in charge of the nationalist movement. Even President Sukarno, the leader of the Indonesian nationalist movement since the 1920s and the country's most powerful orators, statesmen, and national leaders couldn't stay in power if he tried to follow moderate policies. American foreign policy expert decided on a convert operation in 1958 because Sukarno was becoming more left-wing by including members of communist PKI in his ruling coalition and getting more military aid from Eastern Bloc countries that were under the influence of the Soviet Union. So they decided to do something about it. The operation didn't work and the Indonesian government found out about it. It was Sukarno's claim that the United States government had broken Indonesia's law. The incident soared U.S.-Indonesian relations until the Indonesian president was overthrown in a military coup in 1965. The September 30, 1965 incident has a lot of unknowns. But it must be said that the U.S. and its allies were the main winners geopolitically. In the context of the Cold War, the rise of Suharto who was not beholden to the communist movement, would be seen as a big victory by the United States and Britain. This would help Suharto keep up the anti-communist sentiment. Aid flowed to Suharto's camp after the September 30th, 1965 incident, both from Australia and the United States and Great Britain. This is because in the end, Suharto was the one who won Indonesia's Cold War. Suharto was clearly not a member of the PKI because it was a strategic partner. Such help not only helped Suharto build his new order regime, but it also made Sukarno less powerful by keeping the PKI out of the way. So, for the US and its allies, Suharto was a symbol of the US's first victory in Southeast Asia in the Cold War, which the US only fully achieved in 1989 when the USSR broke up. Many people died as a result of the cleansing action taken by the Suharto regime. Most of the people at the lower levels didn't know about this. People still don't know for sure how many people died. There were talks between 
the Soviet Union and Indonesia about diplomatic relations in 1950. The Soviet Union was one of the first countries to recognize Indonesia's sovereignty and independence from the Dutch when World War II came to an end. In the Cold War, both countries had a lot of good things to say about each other. Indonesian President Sukarno went to Moscow and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev went to Jakarta. Indonesia bought gas 69 trucks from the Soviet Union for the first time in 1958. General Abdul Haris Noschen went to Moscow in 1960 to talk about the arms deal with the USSR. The deal consisted of various types of aircraft ranging from carriers to fighter jets, along with whiskey class submarines, Comer class missile boats, and one Sverdlov cruiser. In 1961 to 1962, the Soviet armed forces helped Indonesia with Operation Trikora which was the retake of the Dutch East Indies. Relationships between Indonesia and the United States got worse when Sukarno was overthrown by General Suharto. This may have been because Indonesia's anti-communist policy under Suharto after the failed communist coup and the mass killing of thousands of alleged leftists. Because the Soviet Union isn't thought to have been involved in the attempted coup, diplomatic relations with China were not cut off. During this time, Indonesia was one of many countries that did not go to the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. During the early days of Suharto's presidency, a lot of people thought that he was a bad person because of his beliefs, and Indonesia became more pro-Western in its foreign and economic relations. When President Suharto went to the Soviet Union for the first time in 1989, it happened at the same time as other events that led to the fall of communism in Europe. People in the USSR under Mikhail Gorbachev started to build better relationships with Indonesia and other countries in Southeast Asia. Since the formation of the modern day Russia Federation, things have been better for both countries. The Vietnam War was a long fight in the region of Southeast Asia. When the country of Vietnam was split into two parts, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. After all, communist-run Vietnam and Laos have joined the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is a group of countries that aren't like them. On August 17, 1964, a group of people started to gather outside the White Presidential Palace in the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. It was about mid-morning by the time President Sukarno stepped up to deliver his annual Independence Day address. By then, the crowd had grown to a million people. Just a few hours before, Indonesia had sent 50 guerrillas to the west coast of Malayan Peninsula. They were the first to attack the heartland of Malaysia, which at the time included Singapore. Sukarno was going to fight with guns against what he said was the British-backed Neo-Colonial Federation. Three weeks after that, the Air Force dropped paratroopers into Malaysia. When news stories about the Vietnam War were more important than what happened in the southern part of Southeast Asia, it came close to war. As soon as the Soviet Union and China became bitter enemies, Sukarno and the Indonesian Communist Party, which had 3 million members and 10 million sympathizers, turned to China. They got a warm welcome. During the revolution, Sukarno wanted only the generals stood in the way. They should be killed in a speech on September 30th, 1965, when the communists tried to overthrow the government that night. Six of the top generals were killed, and they were very close to it. General Suharto, who led the successful counter coup, was lucky to be left off the death list drawn up by the people who planned the coup. He quickly took charge. Indonesia had to go backwards the Beijing-Jakarta axis broke up and the confrontation with Malaysia was over. At the end of the war, many communists were killed and the party was banned. Friendly relations were restored with the United States and Indonesia joined Malaysia and Singapore in the Asian group. In the future, Marshall Green, the US ambassador to Indonesia at the time, said that 
A great communist prince would have formed in Southeast Asia if China and Indonesia had formed a strong alliance. This would have included Vietnam, but also the vulnerable countries of mainland Southeast Asia. It would have made Sukarno more pro-communist and more determined to crush Malaysia with the help of China if the United States had left Vietnam before the failed Indonesian coup. Would have hurt the will and ability of the Indonesian generals to fight against the communist takeover if they had not been told. This is what Adam Malik, a former Indonesian foreign minister, thought. If the attempt coup had not happened, Sukarno would soon have been in charge of a communist country in his country. Let's move to Indonesia and the end of Cold War. After the Cold War, Indonesia's military strength in the Southeast Asian region decreased. Its military used to be strong compared to other countries in the region. Its defense equipment started to run out, the welfare of soldiers became tough, and funds were too little. There are several factors that caused the decline of military powers, including the economic crisis, chaotic domestic politics, and full military embargo by the U.S. At the same time, as Indonesia's military weakened, it started to improve. Since the end of the Cold War, Indonesia's had focused on not only rebuilding its military power, but also increasing the capacity of its own military defense industry. The U.S. arms embargo on Indonesia also opened the eyes of Indonesians that they had to have their own defense industry to not rely on other countries but themselves. Now, let's talk about Indonesia and the growing power of China. Since the late 20th century, China started to grow and become more powerful both politically and economically. Asian countries, especially a source of imports like Indonesia, heavily depend on China. However, looking back to the history of Indonesia and China around the 1960s, their relationship did not go well. Indonesians had historical animosities toward China and ethnic Chinese in the country. During this time, there was the threat of communist subversion. The second president, Suharto, came into power in 1965 and countered the coup against communists. Jakarta's growing political alignment with Beijing under Sukarno, the first president, led to a coup that attempted to withdraw Indonesia from United Nations and announced a political axis between Indonesia and China. It is possible that China might support PKI or the Communist Party by funding and leveraging its influence through ethnic Chinese community and communist insurgencies. From all of this, political tensions in Indonesia exploded on 30 September 1965, called the 30 September Movement. Suharto took full control of the army and a full campaign against the Communist Party led to mass killings. The anti-communist credentials of Suharto influenced domestic political legitimacy, which was an excuse for threatening ethnic Chinese in the country. Fortunately, as we move into the next century, Indonesia-China relations have begun to improve. In April 2021, Indonesian President Joko Widodo told the Chinese President Xi Jinping that China was a good friend and brother. Throughout this pandemic era, their relations have further improved because of Beijing's vaccine diplomacy. China has donated vaccines to Indonesia for over 2 million doses. Indonesia seems to lean toward China rather than the U.S. unlike before. As the growing status of China becomes more outstanding, China came up with the Belt and Road Initiatives, or BRI, which is an economic and strategic plan to develop new trade routes, like a Silk Road, and connect China with the rest of the world. From China's perspective, Indonesia is a crucial BRI partner, and for Indonesia, 
China is a large trading partner. To illustrate, China was Indonesia's top export destination in 2020. In 2019, they even signed a local currency settlement agreement to expand the use of the Chinese yuan in Indonesia. It is obvious that China significantly influenced Indonesia's economy. Lots of Chinese investors view Jakarta as an important hub. One Chinese investor once said, When investors talk about Southeast Asia, they are referring to Indonesia, according to South China. This shows that Indonesia is positively affected by the Chinese growing economy. Nonetheless, there can be a few situations that make their relationship go hard. For instance, the Indonesian Navy once tried to detain a Chinese trawler that was accused of fishing in an Indonesian area without permission. The tension in the Natuna Sea made their relationship not smooth for a while. Eventually, the relationship between Indonesia and China is now better and better again. Apart from China's economic power, the Chinese growing power of culture, tourism, and soft power matter. Under the Djokovic government, Indonesia tries to strengthen its relationship with other countries through tourism to boost its economic progress. By 2019, China is on a way to being the biggest tourist market for Indonesia. As China becomes the world's largest population, it offers lots of opportunities including economic development, infrastructure developing, education, big market, and culture. For example, Chinese literature is very famous in Indonesia and the Chinese language is the most famous foreign language after English. Indonesia, like other Asian countries, neither wants China to dominate its own region nor compete with major powers. Although the growing power of China has directly impacted Indonesia, Indonesia is still affected mostly in a positive way. A new economic and trade working group has been formed. Through the signing of a memorandum of understanding, or what's commonly known as an MOU, on the Joint of Economic and Trade Committee, or known as JETCO, between Indonesia Minister of Trade and the UK Secretary of State for International Trade, the UK and Indonesian governments have announced a shared commitment to realizing the potential growth of bilateral trade. In areas including renewable and green energy, foods and drinks, and agriculture commodities, the JETCO will attempt to deepen our bilateral trade, boost cooperation, and resolve market impediments. The announcement comes after the UK and Indonesian government conducted a joint trade review, or a JTR, over the last 18 months to investigate prospects for increased trade and investment, as well as identifying priority industries to expand their commercial relations. As a result, the JRT highlighted nine important sectors for increased collaboration, including education and training, financial and professional services, healthcare and life science, as well as the previous mentioned sectors. Indonesia welcomed the UK's proposal to consider a new agreement to facilitate trade via UK's official export credit agency, UK Export Finance, in addition to the establishment of the JETCO. The UK's main international government financing agency will provide up to £4 billion in competitive long-term financing to the Indonesian government to help it achieve its long-term goals. There would be a mutual support for extension of the MOU on cooperation in the field of creative industry, which will include new areas of bilateral development in digital technology to boost Indonesia's creative economy, and copyright management capabilities. There will also be a shared commitment to fulfilling investment potential, which witnessed a 35% increase in UK investment into Indonesia in 2020. Thanks to reforms established by the Onimbus Law 2020 and its implementing rules to make it easier to invest and do business in Indonesia. 
Both countries also committed to working together to develop the multilateral trading system in order to promote investment, productivity, and economic integration into global supply chains. The deal sets our goals to strengthen our trade and investment relations, deepen our collaboration across a number of industries, from financial services and technology to renewables, to create new markets for UK businesses according to Liz Truss, the UK's International Trade Secretary. We aim to develop economic ties with like-minded nations like Indonesia, which share a commitment in democracy and the international rule-based system, as well as support global Britain's dynamic Asian and Southeast Asia connections. Opportunities and Challenge for Economic Co-Development The United Kingdom has never been one of Indonesia's most important commercial partners. It was the 17th largest trading partner in the country in 2018. While UK exports to Indonesia have been steadily increasing over the last five years, with drops in 2019 and 2020, Indonesian export had been dropping during this time. Nickel and footwear are Indonesia's top export to the United Kingdom. It is the second largest nickel exporter to the United Kingdom after the United States, but it is still behind numerous European footwear exporters in the UK. Indonesia has significant prospect to enhance its exports of a variety of commodities, including palm oil, natural rubbers. The palm oil industry could benefit the most from the pact, which would allow it to increase export. Prior to Brexit, the majority of palm oil exporters to the UK were European countries with no tariffs. Relationship between Indonesia and America. Moreover, the United States of America, the U.S., and Indonesia have a long-standing strategic partnership built on common values, particularly on a strong belief in democracy. The United States and Indonesia share a vision on a free and open Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. and Indonesia share a vision of an Indo-Pacific area that is free and open, including commitments to freedom of navigation and overflight. Indonesia is a leader in Asian and a pillar of the Indo-Pacific rules-based order. The United States is intimately involved in the Indo-Pacific and we and our partners think that reinforcing our shared principles is the best approach to avoid conflict. Our strategic partnership is built on a foundation of security collaboration. In terms of the numbers of annual exercises and events in which we participate together, the United States is delighted to be Indonesia's largest defense partner. Shared commitment to increase our people-to-people -people ties. The Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative has about 40,000 Indonesian members, the most of any Asian country, each year. The United States mission in Indonesia sends up to 200 young Indonesian leaders to the United States to participate in a variety of youth exchange programs and around 8,300 Indonesians studied in the United States annually prior to the pandemic. The United States and Indonesia are continuing to work together to increase the number of exchange students in both nations. Cultural influence that America had from Indonesia, belief, tradition, and custom. Assimilation has been challenging for Indonesian American, leading many to become more devoted to their homeland traditions. The Indonesian application of art is excavably linked to their spiritual sense of belonging to nature and to God. Humanity, nature, and art are all connected in some way. In Indonesia, art, artistic, creativity is notably visible to their clothing. But the clothes make up a large part to their tradition author. But it is a type of design and art that may be created using two different processes. The earlier process is known as Ta Chan Ting because it used a crackable to create the design directly onto the cloth without using wax. When the wax cold, it resists the dye in which the cloth is immersed. When the wax is cold, it resists the dye in which the cloth is immersed, allowing the dye to penetrate 
or the material save the design region. After removing the wax, the dyeing process is repeat. Some consider the second technique to be inferior, since the batik is generated appear to the machine made. The design is actually created with a tea tap, which is a hand applied painting stamp, Bali dance drama, and the Mataram court tradition are two more particular art from the Indonesian people. Taught some Balinese dance eat fervorous, fertile, and playful. Both are inherent religions in nature. Wa Chang or puppet drama have long been popular in Korea. Flat leather puppet are the most popular, but wooden puppet are almost employed. The puppeter sit in front of a white screen, moving puppet around to tell the story. The shadow of the puppet are cast onto the screen by a plum oil lamp. The narrative usually revolve around a good hero who defeat evil using supernatural ability. Many Indonesian engaging the Western art, ranking from oil painting to metal sculpture with subject influenced by Indonesian culture and traditions. Literally, art are also well linked. Local folk tale and tradition religions, legends dominated early Indonesian writing. Taught modern literature is the Indonesian language began in the 1920s. The work of classics. Indonesian authors such as Pa Pancha are still read today. Moving on to holiday and culture event. Despite that innate diversity, particularly all Indonesian Americans celebrating three significant festival, I do thirty, also known as Hari Raja or Rebaran. Celebrate the compilation of the Muslim fasting month of Ramadan, which lasts for thirty days. A traditional Muslim feast is celebrated by many Indonesians. The lunar calendar determines to the date of this holiday, so the date varies from year to year. Cultural influence that Britain had from Indonesia. The United Kingdom and Indonesia are too friendly, innovative, and surprisingly little recent culture exchange. First, the Hive, Tony Maria and Iqbal Rap, two. Yogyakarta based artist create this base pop sculpture instrument built from gramen bar components, which ruler combi, a UK based artist adapt as an installation design. Between 2016 and 2018, there was a significant growth in creative contact between the UK and Indonesia, which were utilized and ignite great improvements in. Disability art in Indonesia. In 2016, UK and Indonesia collaborate with Unlimited to host its first disability art workshop. Later that year, Anissa Lamanir, a disability advocate, Hana Madness, and Billet Dot ID, a dance production company from Indonesia, were invited to UK. Unlimited Festival. The next year, Ballet ID and Kondoko Dance Company formed Can Do Dance, a corporation that brought together hearing and deaf dancer. Festival Bibas Batas, or we call Festival Without Boundaries, Indonesia's first major disability art festival. Was co-created by more than twenty partner, and centered on a large exhibition at the National Gallery of Indonesia, an intensive weekend of performing art look press at the venue, featuring a series of UK Indonesia collaboration. Now we reach the end. We have three questions for you to answer. One. What are the advantage and disadvantage of the Dutch colonization in Indonesia? Two, which war do you think Indonesia suffered the most damage, and why? Three, 
List two interesting facts you learned from the presentation.